Good afternoon, and thank you all for joining us. I'm Rick Wade, Senior Vice President at the United States Chamber of Commerce, and bringing you greetings on behalf of the Chamber and, and our Global Policy Innovation Center and our Equality of Opportunity Initiative, where we're working diligently to address inequalities across America. Together, we're working together to advance diversity in areas like innovation and creativity, because that drives economic and technological success across business and industry. And, and we're so thrilled, super thrilled, to have with us our partner, the Copyright Alliance, for today's, I promise, what will be a, an amazing conversation on the challenges and the opportunities that some of us face when we're trying to attain successful careers in copyright and copyright-related industry sectors. So let's just jump right in. And I'd like to invite Tara, Terica Carrington, Vice President, Legal Policy and Copyright Counsel of the Copyright Alliance to join me. Hi, Terica. Hey, Rick, thank you so much. As Rick just said, I'm Terica Carrington and I'm honored to bring greetings on behalf of the Copyright Alliance. Like the US Chamber, we are committed to increasing diversity throughout the copyright arena. As the unified voice of the copyright community, the Copyright Alliance is working to leverage our unique position as a leader in the copyright space by bringing together creators and representatives from the copyright industries, law firms, and academia to broaden DNI efforts. We are especially excited about opportunities such as this that not only create dialogue on important issues, but center the voices and experiences of those most impacted by this work. Copyright protection provides a way for creators to earn a living as they create the books, movies, music, works of visual art, and other creative works that document our world, tell our stories, and enrich our lives. It is of vital importance that those creators and their works, which help shape our society, are representative of the rich diversity of people and communities across America. And it's also important that the people and industries that represent these creators reflect this same rich diversity and foster inclusive and equitable environments. Today's discussion will focus on systemic barriers and how we might address those barriers to achieve these ends. Rick, I know the Chamber's Equality of Opportunity Initiative is also committed to addressing systemic barriers to opportunity. Can you share a bit more about these efforts? Yeah, Terry, you're absolutely right. You know, this is so timely. I was just in Atlanta and had a really interesting conversation with rapper Waka Flocka Fane. And it was really interesting because and it's so timely because we think about the contributions that our artists like uh, Waka Flocka and others make, uh, why this is so important. And we're proud of the work that we're doing here at the U.S. Chamber and especially proud of partnerships like the one we have with the Copyright Alliance. This work is so important. And it's important, yeah, that we have these kinds of conversation, but it's equally important or quite frankly, more important that we move from dialogue to real action. And through our Equality of Opportunity Initiative or agenda, you know, we're working with companies and leading companies across the country in what we call a business-centered or business-focused strategy. That's about not only advancing public policy solutions to these challenges, but also private sector solutions uh, to address the systemic inequalities that exist in, in many different areas, like education and health, employment, entrepreneurship, criminal justice, and even wealth. But this conversation that we're having today is, is very, very important. It's a priority uh, for the chamber, not just because this work is the right thing to do, it's a moral imperative, but there's a business and economic case. This is about America's competitiveness. And you know what, Terrica, this work is driven by data and it's driven by conversation with companies across America. And I was just thinking about and looking at some of the data, uh, you know, such as, you know, 1.7%. Only 1.7% of intellectual property attorneys are black. Think about it, 1.9% are Hispanic or Latinx and only 0.1% are Native Americans. We got a lot of work to do. And we recognize that the private sector has an opportunity to lead and lean in in developing strategic tangible solutions that can make a difference in closing these gaps and changing the lives of, of, of companies and entrepreneurs and artists, uh, individuals, and having a meaningful impact across America. And so we're excited about today's conversation. It's about advancing and, and hearing from the voices of, of experienced and uh, of individuals who do this work every day and try and pass forward together. And we're committed, I want you to know, to know that, that we're committed at the US Chamber to elevating these voices and highlighting the roles that they play in the nation's economy and strengthening an American ensuring. And we gotta work to ensure that they have the access to the opportunities that they need uh, as creators and entrepreneurs and professionals, academics, and more, and everyone in this community to succeed. So we're excited. 
Yeah, Rick, you're absolutely right. And those numbers that you just cited are, are, are pretty shocking. And I hope that we can get started on helping to make those numbers much more equitable and reflective of our society. Uh, the Copyright Alliance is truly honored to be working in collaboration with the US, Ch US Chamber to advance these efforts. I know you're as excited for today's conversation as I am. We're gonna hear from some dynamic speakers that span experiences in the copyright industry, including creators and those representing the legal profession. Through the lens of each of these individuals, we want to understand the why behind the start gaps and get clear on solutions. For that reason, we've created intentional spaces to hear from creators, industry representatives, and others who care about breaking down these barriers as much as we do. And that includes each of you in our audience. In fact, one of the highlights I'm most looking forward to is closing out today's event with a roundtable discussion that will be open to the full audience joining us on Zoom. So get ready to bring your own stories and experiences to this conversation. So without further delay, let's get started. I'd like to start by welcoming Representative Sharice Davids, who will provide our keynote address. Good afternoon, everybody. I'm so excited to uh, be able to join you all today. And um, thank you, uh, Terika, for the uh, you know, introduction and, and uh, kicking us off here this morning and, um, and, and, and to Rick uh, for the work you're doing over there too. I, I'm Representative Sharice Davids. I have the honor of representing Kansas's third congressional district in Congress. And uh, I appreciate the invite to uh, help kick off today's uh, event and you know, share a little bit about my experience and background. And um, yeah, I'm, uh, I'm very excited about the, the work you all are doing. Uh, you know, when I was first elected to Congress in 2018, I, I became part of uh, the most diverse freshman class of members uh, in history. And you know, we came from all kinds of different backgrounds that had never been represented on Capitol Hill before. And um, along with uh, now Secretary of Interior, Deb Holland, I became one of the first two Native American women ever elected to Congress. Um, she left me, it's, it's fine. Uh, <laughs> just kidding, I'm excited. I'm so excited that she's um, uh, running the Department of Interior now. Um, you know, I, I, cause I, I think that the, the diversity that, um, that our class brought in uh, has really helped us to craft uh, policy and and to elevate issues that are incredibly impactful um, and and many that have been overlooked uh, for a long time and you know that 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 is the power of diversity that we're um, and representation that we're able to harness and. Um, you know, our, especially right now, as our country is grappling with a once in a generation public health crisis and subsequent economic crisis, we're seeing really how important representation, uh, of course, in Congress, but in so many other spaces, um, just how important it is. And, you know, I think um, la last year when, when the, we were doing work, I sit on the Small Business Committee. Um, I, you know, I, I was able to, um, to, to do some really interesting work during the creation of the Paycheck Protection Program. You know, hopefully uh, folks are, are familiar with that program, but, you know, this is um, a program that was really designed to benefit so many of our um, small business uh, owners across the country. And um, I ended up speaking up to make sure that tribally owned businesses uh, were included in that program and able to access those critical funds because certainly that was a piece of what Congress wanted. Um, but you know, it's an it's an example just in my current workplace um, of uh, of of ways that having a diverse representation can can help bring forward um, sometimes far-reaching and and very consequential impacts across the country. And and I know every industry. Uh, experiences this, and um, all of us have a platform uh, that we can use to advance representation to ensure that everybody has a seat at the table. And um, you know, in 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 your space, you're working with creators and artists, or you're a creator yourself. Um, but but I know you see the impact of representation firsthand. And um, in some, I'm not trying to convince you to run for Congress by pointing out the similarities in your work and my work. Um, but if you decide to, let me know. Um, but you know, we're 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 all doing a lot of like similar, at least similarly uh, mission driven uh, work, where we want to make sure that um, not only 
that something is created that's representative, but um, but also that we that we get to see it, you know, in in media, in um, the creative spaces that you all are in, and so um, you know, it's it it's it's so vital um, the work that you all are doing, and I very much appreciate it. Um, and I got to see kind of firsthand um, because earlier this year I published a children's book um, about about my life, and it it featured um, you know, art and illustrations from, a, a native, a first nations, um, uh, illustrator who has now gone on to, um, do many more, um, uh, picture books and, and other really interesting things. And, um, during that project, I, I, I found out, um, I almost was going to say discovered, but I think that's like maybe a funny word to use in this context. Um, but I, I found out that, you know, only 1% of children's books that are published in the US feature Native American or indigenous characters. That's not native authors or illustrators. It's the number of characters in, in books. That's a lot of books um, and a very low number of um, native characters. And so I think, you know, having the chance to share my story to show kids um, whether they're native or not, that um, all our paths are, are different. Um, all of us is, uh, you know, we're, we all deserve to be seen and heard is, um, you know, it, it's, it's been a big part of my journey. And I wanted to be able to share that with others, you know, and, and show, show uh, the young and the young at heart that a member of Congress can look a lot of different ways. So um, I know that there's probably a lot of people on um, today, although I can't see everybody. Um, so I don't know, I'll imagine a bunch of people nodding their heads, but um, I've spent a lot of time knowing what it's like to be the only person like me in the room. And I imagine that there are probably a number of people who have experienced that. And because of that, one thing that I try to do is always look around and say, who else hasn't been here before? Who else needs to have a seat at the table? And, and what can we do uh, from my perspective to help help bring those voices in. You know, we've come a long way on that front. Um, and and I've, I've been honored to be a uh, part of, again, the most diverse freshman class in history and, and to be able to work uh, on this stuff in a time in history where you get to see um, actually the fruits of a lot of the labor that's been going on. Um, that I think continuing to think through that lens because there's still a lot of work to be done can really help advance um, these goals of uh, representation and inclusion that you all have been talking about. Um, and I'm sure you all, you're going to take that frame today as you move forward and continue to discuss how to kind of navigate the challenges or break down the barriers, um, to, to attain success, you know, whatever that looks like in, in your individual spaces or for you. Um, so I guess I'll, I'll stop. Uh, thank you for inviting me to, to join you all for a few minutes. Thank you to the Copyright Alliance and, uh, and the U.S. Chamber uh, for putting on this event, for focusing on this very important issue. Thank you so much, Representative Davids. We're really, really grateful for you to be here today and really appreciative of those remarks. I think they set a great um, groundwork and context for the rest of the discussion that we're going to have today. I, I'm really grateful for uh, your words today. And I think one of the things that you touched on, which really hit home for me, is the importance of diversity and inclusion across the board. You know, it's, it's great to have you know, diverse representatives in Congress. It's great to have uh, diverse representatives in industry and in cre creativity all across the board. So really grateful for to have you today. Um, so with that, we're gonna transition now to hear from a creator. We're gonna hear from Ebony Smith, who is a music producer and audio engineer. And she's also on the steering committee of the Recording Academy's Producers and Engineers Wing. Hey, my name is Ebony Smith. I live in Memphis, Tennessee. Um, I am a music producer and I'm so excited to talk a little bit about copyrights and the importance of those rights. Um, the right to copy for us who are artists, music creators, um, songwriters, producers, engineers, it's very important that our intellectual property is protected, right? That's how we get paid. That's how we make money. I've been very fortunate to work on a number of incredible projects in the music business. Some that you might know include Hamilton, the cast album, um, Janelle Monae's Dirty Computer, just to name a few. And the importance of those works are so far reaching because they've had an opportunity to go out into the world and 
and affects so many people, so many young people in particular. And so the importance of copyrights involves being able to protect that content as it has come from the originator, the creator, the, the person with the initial idea. Um, it's important that as that idea gets fixed to media or some other form of technology, that those rights, that intellectual property is still protected. So I'm so excited that the Copyright Alliance is doing this, as well as speaking to the importance of diversity within the field of copyright protection and copyright adjacent se sectors, for example, like the music industry. Um, in addition to being a music producer, I also formed a nonprofit called Gender Amplified, whose responsibility is to shine a light on women in music production, help them raise their visibility and find more ways to professionalize themselves. So copyright protection is part and parcel to that mission as well. Um, thank you so much for all the work that you do and for shining a light on diversity and inclusion within the world of copyrights. All right, well, thank you so much um, to Ebony Smith for just taking some time to talk about how um, copyright protections really empower her to contribute her creative voice. Um, and so without further ado, and to that effect, we'll have our first panel for today's event in which we'll have the chance to hear from uh, two wonderful creators to kind of talk about how they're telling their stories and uh, what a strong creative community means for them. Um, and so before that, I would like to remind our audience members to please keep your microphones uh, muted to minimize any interruptions. Um, by way of introdu introduction, my name is Rachel Kim. I am a copyright counsel at the Copyright Alliance. And today I am joined by two wonderful uh, creator panelists. The first uh, being Marie D. De Jesus. She is an award-winning uh, staff photojournalist at the Houston Chronicle and she shoots and produces both still and moving images in the nation's fourth largest city. She was a finalist for the Pulitzer Prize in the category of public service and is the winner of the public service award from the Scripps Howard Foundation. Marie's works tell the story of uh, stories of underrepresented communities, including immigrants and refugees, and focuses on subjects such as education and other societal issues uh, touching and concerning these communities. And then next we have Grace Wu. She is the Executive Vice President of Entertainment Casting at NBC Universal Television and Streaming. At the beginning of her entertainment journey, Grace worked as a production assistant on the Margaret Cho Show, All American Girl, which she described as her watershed moment because as a young Asian American woman, she had never seen an Asian American family on television. Grace has since then been on the forefront of a variety of hit shows including This Is Us, Friday Night Lights, New Amsterdam, and Parenthood. So thank you, uh, Marie and Grace, so much for just taking some time out of your day to uh, join us and share your thoughts and experiences on how uh, diversity in our creative industries can really um, fuel the discussion about um, and impact you know, various uh, communities who are underrepresented. Um, so one, the first question I think I have for both of you um, is kind of how did you get into the field you are in today? Um, were there any sort of challenges or obstacles along the way, whether they were internal or external, um, that you found along in your journey uh, as a person from an underrepresented community? So Marie, I'll start off um, with you. Thank you, Rachel. It's such a pleasure to be here with you. Uh, so I am a Puerto Rican photographer. Uh, I have been with the Houston Chronicle for eight years. I am also the national secretary for uh, NPPA. And, uh, you know, I was a human behavior student in college. And on my third year, I decided to venture and try something new for an elective course. And that was the beginning of a career in photo. Uh, I believe that my interest for human behavior was absolutely the motivator to then branch out to journalism. Uh, and the challenges, God, I mean, I was a, a very naive Puerto Rican, you know, young photographer trying to, trying to find my way. And I believe that uh, English as a second language was 
that was a that was a challenge because I mean, you know, it, it's this thing about learning how to advocate for yourself in newsrooms. Uh, truly be able to get them to understand that I am way beyond or way more than their preconceived ideas of what a Puerto Rican woman is. And so 14 years ago, only very few newspapers had some kind of like Latina, right? The Orlando Sentinel had Latinas. I am pretty sure that probably San Antonio Express News and some others, but we're talking minimum, okay? Uh, so I found... I found my my place little by little being able to navigate, but it was a struggle. It was a struggle to be able to understand the quirkiness of the subtle cultural things that were happening around me, right? I'm not only trying to become a solid storyteller, a visual journalist, a, a really good photographer, uh, trying to like understand composition, trying to understand uh, audio and, and visuals and video, but I'm also trying to understand my my entorno right what it's around me inside the industry and i think that was the biggest challenge mm. wow and grace for uh, you i know again you had this this watershed moment but um any other kind of obstacles or challenges you faced on on the way to where you are today you know, I think for me, you know, I'm born and raised in LA and I grew up in a very um, diverse community where, and it went to a very large public high school where I got um, involved in, in theater. And I remember um, when I think about the people that I was in theater with, um, I mean, I don't know what everyone, I mean, I think, I feel like a lot of high school experience when you talk about theater kids, like it's a very particular type of kid, a little, someone who's a little extra. Um, but like, I feel like the kids in my program were certainly extra, but also I remember, you know, like, like one of the best singers that we had was this Asian American woman who, a uh, girl who, um, I just, I was always so, was so admired her because she was, was a great, had a great voice, but it was also really funny and had such confidence in stage. And there was actually a couple of people like that in that group. And I remember it, it, even though I wasn't seeing, you know, necessarily actors like that on screen, it, I just, it felt empowering to know that in the community that I lived in and, and grew up in, that there were people who had a passion for the arts, had an interest in it, had the talent, and, and certainly then the confidence to pursue it. So I think that's, when I think back about sort of like, you know, my origin story and about like what, what really propelled, you know, my, um, my sort of path, I think it really started there in high school, just looking around me and seeing people that, you know, were creative and, and wanted to pursue their passion and felt like they were entitled to, you know, be front and center too, along with the rest of the kids that had this dream. Wow, thank you. Thank you for sharing that. And, and it's so interesting, because both of you kind of touched on on your origin stories. But it's funny because because Marie, it's it's the exact opposite. Marie, you were looking around and there was no one. And then Grace, you were looking around and there was everyone. So it's just really interesting how those polar opposite experiences got you to where you are today. Um, so kind of along those lines, um, you know, why is it important, do you think, that we kind of discuss these issues um, and make sure that we have you know, our creative communities having these diverse stories and diverse voices. And I know you, you two sort of touched on that, but, you know, if there was one takeaway um, or like one answer to that question, what, what would your answer be? And really anybody can start on, on this topic. I mean, I can say from, go ahead. Okay, go ahead. <laughs> go, go, go. Um, I, I can tell you that from the industry, journalism industry aspect of it, I think that we owe it to our readers. We, we owe it to our viewers uh, that they see people like them, people that can ask questions that are relevant to them. It would only make us better creators. It would only make us better journalists because I bring something that others might not be able to bring. You know, it's, it, 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 I, you know, I am a public servant to a certain level, a community, right? Like my job, it, it goes beyond like my nine to five. I owe myself to my community to a certain point. Yeah, and I think for me, you know, I just think the, 
there's such value and and sort of humanity and people feeling seen. And so, and what I mean by that, that feels it's a broad thing to say, but you know, anytime I'm having a conflict or um, trying to solve a problem at work or trying to cast something and there's an issue, I, you know, my first instinct really is to like one, like, okay, Grace, stop talking now and listen and let this person express like what their, you know, what their point of view is, what the challenge is, what they want. And I just feel like it's just a very human thing. Like people just want to be seen when they want to be understood. And I think on the bigger scale, that also means seeing, you know, people that look like them on screen, because I think it just, it gives you kind of validation of like, oh, well, that's right. Like the experience that I'm having is really, is incredibly, um, it's not as, it's like, it's not as small as it feels like for me. It's actually very relatable. It's very human. And I think that, I think when people have that kind of comfort or um, feel embraced, I think that, I think that leads to just better behavior. I think it leads to more goodwill. I think it leads to you, um, you know, individuals wanting to be, you know, wanting to feeling like they're part of the culture at large. And, you know, without sounding like self-promoting, I do feel like that's the value of like what we put on our air on television. Like that when people do see themselves and their stories being expressed, it just makes you feel a little less alone. And I think when you're less alone, you probably don't act, you know, you don't act on your terrible instincts or any bad behavior because you just feel like, okay, you know, I'm, I am part of this, this community here. So I matter. And I, you know, and I better be looking after not just myself, but other people too. Mm -hmm. Mm, that's really powerful. And um, I, I think, again, both of you being creators, I think this is a great panel. And again, thank you for joining us because, Grace, I think you touched on this, but telling stories is a really human experience. And Marie, you touched on this too, but it's it's an age-old human experience. I mean, but the ways we tell stories are so different. And Marie, you tell it through, you know, photojournalism and Grace, you tell it through the medium of television. But, you know, through that, you can you can reach a certain person and, and make them feel seen and heard, even if, you know, they're behind a screen or they're just, you know, seeing a photo in a newspaper. But um, no, that was, that was really great. Um, and so, uh, kind of along those lines of, you know, diversity in our creative communities is, is important because it enables us to tell rich stories, to tell, um, people and about these experiences, um, kind of what experiences have you gone through? Were there any kind of memorable moments or singular events that you can point to where you really saw that impact um, in an underrepresented community, like where your work kind of gave back or, you know, started to lift those voices up a little bit more? Well, like, you know, I think through sort of my advocacy of talent, you know, whether, and it's always, you know, I think when we talk about diversity, we always talk about sort of racial and, and ethnic and even gender diversity, but something that I've been really um, focused on the last few years is also actors with disabilities, because I feel like that's such a, that's a group of people that have really been overlooked. And I would say that the last, um, we've got two shows currently on the fall schedule um, on NBC now, uh, one called La Brea, which is doing very well for us and also Ordinary Joe, which I wish was doing better, <laughs> but both shows have disabled characters in them. And that's, and I always, you know, when I've gone, when I've met people just sort of, you know, civilians in the world, when they tell me that they love seeing Zyra, you know, who's a, a dis, um, she's an, an amputee on the show. And that was a, a I, I can't even take the credit for that character. It was conceived on the page, but we were able, when we did the, the big search for that role, I knew that we were not going to we were going to find that, that, that girl. And even if she wasn't a very good actress, I was, I just said, we're going to make her a great actress. We're going to get her the best coaches. We're going to make sure that our writer doesn't write her long monologues. Like we're going to make sure she succeeds. We're going to set her up for success. And we did. And she's such a powerful, cool, like, I think she's, she's incredible. And then Christopher also on our show, Ordinary Joe, he, his character was based on, um, and, uh, the creator's son who also has a similar, disability. he's, he um, is in a wheelchair. And I just, I love that, that, you know, anyone that disabled people, you know, across the country and the world, if these shows hopefully, you know, get syndicated, are going to see some powerful images of people that are, you know, 
in a it, that are shown in a show in a very meaningful way that the stories are being told that they have a lot of you know flaws that they're not perfect so we're not canonizing these these characters they just feel like very human and so that's something that I don't want to drop the ball on that I want to continue you know in my um as I'm as we're I'm advocating for talent and, and identifying people for our shows that I don't overlook um like everybody so that everyone feels like feels welcome on the shows that we're that we're producing Uh, so it, it, it's funny because the example I was going, I'm, I'm going to bring is related to also special special needs. Um, so I worked on a, on a story related to how Texas was it was neglecting. Uh, we're talking about hundred thousand uh, students with special needs in, in 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 their educational system, and we worked on this story for a year and. You know, we we talked to like 500 families. Like it, it was just the way that the state was dropping the ball on on their own students. It was it was horrible. And I remember going from family to family, photographing. You know, we 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 were able to find really strong voices for this story. And at the end, the federal government came to the state, and they were able to put a stop to this policy that no one knew that there was this like cap that it was only an 8% of students were going to receive special services uh, in, the, in, the in the public education system. So we shed light on this and it, it you know, it, you, you could see, you, we would go to events and parents would tell us, thank you so much for, you know, for bringing this to light. Thank you for telling such a difficult story in a sensitive, empathetic, mm. and human way. Uh, and I, I think that was a turning point in my career to truly understand the, the power um, of what we do, of photo, of audio, of visuals, of, of storytelling. It was, you know, it it's not just only presenting it, but how you present it, how, you know, what kind of how do you amplify these voices? So that for me, that was, um, it was a very special uh, moment in my career. Mm. Thank you both so much for sharing those experiences. I mean, I think it goes to show that, you know, diversity and inclusion issues, they're not things and topics we just talk about. They're actually, they work in real life. I mean, Marie, with your example of, you know, the, the parents of these special needs kids and um, Grace, with your example of, you know, being able to cast these characters because they're written for um, and, and accounted for on these shows. I mean, again, it's just real world examples of, of how it, it affects individuals um, through these powerful mediums and stories. So that's that's really great. Thank you both for sharing your experiences um, on that. And so um, my final question to you both is sort of, I mean, I guess we, we did kind of talk about this, but you know, how far have we come so far? Uh, because you know, I think there's a lot of talk on how can we increase diversity and inclusion, which is very important, but kind of how far have we come? And then Grace, I think, and you too, Marie, kind of touched on this, but like, what kind of stories do we need to hear more of? Um, what What's the next step after that? Well, you know, I think, um, I mean, I know for me personally, I'm feeling really encouraged about the kind of shows that we're producing especially with the work that we're doing behind the camera, because we are, we're working with creators who are diverse and who want to tell their stories. And so there's not any, um, so they're just, they're very authentic stories. So I'm, I feel very uh, empowered by that. And I also love that we're taking risks with people that frankly have never created a television show, but because their, their voice and their vision is so inspired, we we're just going to, you know, we're going to again, similar to some of the actors that, you know, we hired on the shows, like we're going to set them up for success by making sure that they have the right support in place, that we have people mentoring them when they're developing their shows and then further, you know, um, making sure that they've got the support when they're on set so that they're, that they're not going to, um, that they have, that they can, again, be set up to, to succeed. So that, that I'm excited about, but I'm also, I think what I'm, what I love seeing too are stories that don't feel like kind of the same you know, where we have to be protective about how we portray people um, of different 
races and ethnicities ethnicities were I think we always felt like it was kind of a precious commodity because it was so it was so rare so that we couldn't tell stories that felt that dimensional they were always kind of the you know the heroic people and by the way yes please I would love it if you thought of me as a hero but but you know I think I'm flawed and I have a lot of you know there are a lot of um you know a lot of issues that I have that anybody that, that are also very human where I don't I don't want to always see kind of the sanitized version of it I love seeing the you know of I, I could be a villain or, or you know there could be um I think more rich stories that we don't have to be afraid of because I do feel like you know I've heard this before in development that when we do, are taking a person of color and putting, putting them at the center there is something almost a protective shell we put around them because you feel like well gosh there's so few images of them we don't want to then kind of go down the road of of um putting out there's something that feels uh negative but I think that because there's such a there's more of a volume of these stories then we don't then every story doesn't have to be weighted so heavily like it's the only one that's being portrayed you can have much more diversity more dimension more complexity because I think then that just feels more relatable and um and authentic to me absolutely absolutely those are really great next steps and yeah go ahead Marie <laughs> Um, I, I mean, I don't have much, I mean, you know, Grace explained this very beautifully, but, um, you know, give a chance to creative, incredible creators from diverse communities. Number two, pay us fairly from the beginning, please, from the beginning, because then it, it might take us an entire life to like, catch up. Uh, and number three, teach them a little bit, not just about uh, creating a beautiful frame, but also how to advocate for themselves, like I said earlier. I love that. I'm so glad you raised that, Marie, about um, paying paying um, equi pay, pay equity, because I think that's something that, you know, I know we've tried to address as a company the last few years, because, you know, just even when we looked at the framework of some of the salaries, you do, you realize that there is this unconscious bias, you know, I mean, I was seasoned, I was seeing seasoned character actors who honestly like I would have expected their fee to be at a certain number and it wasn't and and you just think what happened here like how could you know like you just wonder like what in the system what what kind of framework have we been you know um, living in and perpetuating by not taking a minute and actually like just you know like anything else it's so hard we're we all we're all we're all on this like constant like steamroller so sometimes it's hard to like get everyone to to stop and like be thoughtful for a minute but I'm really grateful that I work for a company where we did really, like, I'd say like, you know, probably in the last five years, we've absolutely been looking at our, um, at our salaries for our actors and, and employees too. I know that's actually, it's trickled down and just, and looking across the board to see how we can make up for any gaps that, um, so that we don't, we're not going to continue this um, sort of the pay inequity. Thank you. I mean, thank thank you both for for talking about all of these great next steps and and kind of concrete like conclusions we can come away with. Um, and you know, I think this will be excellent excellent um, topics to discuss at the roundtable. So I'm really looking forward to what people have to say um, on all that. So thank you both again for. Um, joining us on this panel and just really sharing all your really great thoughts and um, and experiences on these issues. Um, so next we're going to move into um, be well before we move into the next panel, we're going to hear from two additional creators um, about what the creative community and uh, what copyright law means to them. My name is Yannick DaCosta. I'm a Jamaican-born graphic designer and fine art painter currently living in Fort Lauderdale, Florida. Copyright has supported my career by giving me the ability to create truly distinct brand identities in advertising for my clients all over the country, as well as to help me secure and profit from the monetization of my paintings through varying art licensing projects. As a graphic designer, I started a design firm, YKMD Visual Communications, to continue building brand experiences that solve problems for real people, like I did for companies like Micromatic, Sheridan, Coachella Music Festival, Under Armour, Open English, Incom, and Newpoint Media, to name a few. As a fine artist, I've participated in over 55 exhibitions and art markets since 2016, with my first international exhibition in 2017. 
I have art collectors from California to London, and I wanted to make my art more accessible for those who couldn't secure an original painting. So I created merchandise that is constantly being shipped and sold around the world. These are the things that have allowed the creative child I was born to grow into a thriving adult, living her nomadic dreams and making a living in any time zone, being able to jump on a plane at the drop of a dime to explore new horizons without the ability to protect my ideas, protect my creativity, protect my intellectual property. The life I live wouldn't be possible. Hi, I'm Valerie Redhorse Mole. I am a documentary filmmaker. I am of Cherokee heritage and just really proud to have been given the honor to bring so many wonderful stories to the screen. My latest documentary, Man Killer, is about the life of our amazing Cherokee leader, Wilma Man Killer. This is her poster behind me. And I had the honor of making this particular film alongside Gil and Heard. I serve on most of my films as a writer, producer, and director. And I'm very thankful for copyright laws that protect my work as a creative person. As an indigenous woman, I recognize that our history has been challenging. My own family suffered across the trail of tears and suffered from loss of land and loss of culture. My father was forced into a boarding school and it is a challenging history, but I look forward to a promising future where we have a raised awareness a collaboration, and hopefully an equitable future for all. But because of the loss of land and the loss of culture and the challenges of our history, I'm especially sensitive to ownership. And I really applaud and support the copyright laws that protect all of us as artists, but especially those of us as Indigenous artists. It is important to us that our art, that our stories, that our work be protected. It is very personal. And the US copyright laws were designed to do just that for all artists. But I think it is especially essential for those of us that come from communities where ownership has been threatened. And now it's something that we really do want to protect. I have been so honored to live in a world where I am free to tell stories that our history books have left out um, the world of documentary filmmaking has been so receptive. We have made stories about the Choctaw Code Talkers and the Navajo Code Talkers who served our country um, so um, willingly and bravely using their language. I have made uh, documentaries about native food and native music and have just been honored my entire career and again, I celebrate the teams that have supported my work. I have celebrated the talent alongside me. But like any work of art, whether it's a book or a song or a, an entire film, it is a creative collaboration that is unique and that ownership is special and important and needs to be protected. There is not a lot of money in documentary filmmaking. And the little money that we have retained uh, goes right back into the films and, and actually goes into our next film and our next project. And so I, again, just applaud and support the efforts to continue to uphold the copyright laws that protect my work and my fellow artists' work. And coming from you as an indigenous person in this country who has had a family suffer from a challenging history, but believes in a bright future ahead, I again applaud and am thankful for the copyright laws that protect my art. Thank you so much. Good morning or good afternoon, depending on what part of the country you're tuning in from. My name is Jaya Thomas, and I am a sports and entertainment and intellectual property attorney. Um, I have also been teaching copyright law and the entertainment industry, a course at UCLA for the past five or six years, and very excited to moderate this next conversation with Greg and Karen. Uh, before we jump into the questions uh, that I have for them, I'm going to have each of them just give a very brief introduction about themselves, and then I will jump into uh, my questions. So Greg, we will start with you. If you can give a quick intro about yourself, please. 
Uh, hi, my name is Greg O'Lanron. I am a partner with uh, Mitchell Silverberg and Knopf um, in the Washington DC office. We're based in Los Angeles. I do copyright and entertainment uh, litigation. I make that distinction because while most of my work, most of my copyright litigation is within the entertainment industry, but I've also done uh, copyright litigation work outside of uh, that, outside of the entertainment industry. So it's a pleasure to be here. To us. Thank you. Thank you, Greg. Karen? Hi, thank you. It's a pleasure to be here. Um, I have been practicing copyright law both in and out of the government for the last, um, I won't say how many years, but for a long time. And um, right now I am currently serving as the Global General Counsel of the Motion Picture Association, uh, the leading advocate advocacy organization for the film, television, and streaming industry. I previously served as the United States uh, Register of Copyrights and Director of the U.S. Copyrights, as well as um, the Associate Register of Copyrights focusing on policy and international affairs. Thank you. Thank you both for being here. Thank you. So my first question for you is, in your opinion, what are some of the biggest barriers for Black professionals or people from other underrepresented communities to seek entry into the copyright industry? Well, I'm happy to start off real quick. I think, you know, one of the, the, the barriers, um, you know, we talk a lot about, um, I think, the, the fact that the copyright industries um, and, and copyright law, it, it, it is really somewhat insular. Uh, I, I think we all know each other or, you know, in, in some way, shape or form. Um, we're in, either in the Copyright Alliance or the Copyright Society. Um, and I think that that's, that's great because it does on one hand, on one hand, because it really does provide a feeling of community. I know a thousand people that I could potentially call and ask a copyright question or uh, people who are interested in copyright law and copyright nerds like myself. But I do think that that also does serve as a barrier um, to some people as well and to uh, underrepresented groups um, in particular, because you know you already have to kind of know a little bit about the industry to, to know where to go, to know who to see. And we always encourage young lawyers to network, but you know it's, it's hard if you don't already have some of those connections. So I think one of the, the barriers really is um, the insularity of the industry sometimes is difficult to quote unquote break in and being able to break in really is, is, is the most important to be able to launch your career later on. You just need that one opportunity and often once you have that opportunity, you're able to utilize it um, to really grow, but it's often difficult to get that, that special opportunity where you can break into the um, kind of more insular community uh, of copyright law. I also think that the, the, the insularity somewhat breeds a lack of diversity. And when you have a lack of diversity, then you don't have role models, you don't have mentors, uh, and you don't have sponsors and people that are interested to really guide you through that process. And, and I can tell you, I mean, pers from personal experience, when I was in law school, I think I needed to fill out one more uh, a part of my schedule, and I just I picked trademark and copyright. And I think I dropped about three, three or four weeks after registration because I thought it was just boring and I, couldn't really, I didn't really have a feeling for it. And of course, down the line, several years later, I, I wound up by accident doing copyright work and ended up with a really good uh, partner who really taught me a lot about copyright. And that's how I landed in that space. It was not by design at all. And I really wish I, I, knew, I knew a little bit more than I wound up finding out about, about, uh, about copyright. But I, but I think not having people that you can look up to, not have people that can guide you, uh, and just uh, the, the pure lack of, lack of diversity, is, was, I think was a big part uh, of, of my journey, uh, in, in, even though I finally wound up in it, purely by accident. Yeah, and I would just add one other thing. I think it's, you know, it, it can also be even practical. Um, when you think about, um, you know, getting that, that breakout position or, or developing yourself, um, you know, for first year law students, for example, um, a lot of people um, have to uh, do voluntary internships their first year. There are a lot of times, you know, you're not going to be hired. Um, and a lot of great internships in the copyright field, you know, have been unpaid internships. A lot of um, people of color and underrepresented 
communities um, can't afford necessarily to spend an entire summer um, often flying somewhere else um, to to like stay in LA or, or New York pay for their um, rent and not get paid. Um, so the, the lack of having you know, those types of internships that are actually paid internships, I think also affects uh, and serves as a kind of uh, an unconscious uh, barrier uh, that was certainly not intended to be a barrier, but ultimately becomes one for, for some individuals. That's a great point by both of you. And um, Karen, I'm gonna piggyback off your previous answer, speaking about law students. Um, and how difficult it is for some, you know, law students to, to work these unpaid internships. For the both of you, what advice would you give to law students or young professionals who are interested in careers in copyright? What is one piece of advice you would give them, whether in terms of networking or whether in terms of trying to secure a role in this space? I would say, you know, to, to take advantage of, um, you know, any of the uh, types of programs, first of all, that you have at your, your law school. Um, so, you know, for example, my law school has, you know, the Kerner Center for, for Law and Media. They do a lot of events, a lot of free events where you can go and actually um, hear from, from uh, various practitioners, um, see various practitioners, um, but also join some of the organizations. A lot of them do have student rates. Um, so the ABA intellectual property section, um, obviously the uh, copyright United States Co copyright society rather, um, they have a student rate as well. And go and, and to the extent that you can go to some of those events, um, that's a way to get to know people. Um, and then if you have the opportunity, if you can't, for example, uh, afford to uh, take an unpaid internship your first year, so you have to get a paid internship that doesn't let you um, work in their specific area that you're interested in. You know, see if you can you know uh, work on the journal that is uh, focused on entertainment and uh, law, uh, see if you can uh, do some research um, for a, a law professor in your uh, particular law school that is focused on in that particular area that would allow you to both have the networking capability, but also to, to get more um, knowledge in that specific area. And I think in addition to that, I think almost every state bar has uh, an IP law section. Uh, although uh, the, the, the patent people have somehow co-opted the phrase IP. So a lot of the things when you talk about IP that you're really talking about patent, but IP as everyone on this call knows is, you know, got a copyright, trademark, and patent. But so a lot of students do so this somewhat, not misinformation, but uh, misunderstanding uh, tend not to, uh, uh, not to take copyright as serious because it's uh, copyright and trademark tend to be referred to as this soft IP. Uh, but just understanding that almost every state bar, at least in the tri-state area, uh, uh, Maryland, uh, uh, DC, and Virginia all have IP sections, and then the organizations that Karen mentioned also do. I know LA does, and uh, New York, and, and I think probably Boston and Chicago. The, ma the major cities, major metropolitan areas, all have IP sections of some form. I think that's uh, those are opportunities for students to uh, to to get involved. I also think about. Uh, limiting your IP knowledge or your interest, IP interest area to just the entertainment space. Even though, uh, uh, as Karen knows, my, uh, my expertise, uh, one of my expertise is in statutory licenses, and which I've never heard of before I started practicing. And I'm part of one of the few people in the country that, that works in that area. And, but I've also done uh, uh, copyright work in, in entertainment, uh, software, uh, in retail, healthcare, uh, architectural works. There's this vast area of copyright for those interested that will have opportunities to work in as opposed to just, uh, just uh, the entertainment space, all the, the well-known areas. So they're great opportunities and they're just as interesting. Uh, some of the best work that I've done have been in those areas. So yeah, it's just expanding your base of interest, so. Great insight. Um, my next question for both of you is a lot of 
professionals from underrepresented communities oftentimes seek careers where they can give back to their communities. Does a career in copyright allow them to do that, do you think? Absolutely. <laughs> I, I, I think it does. I think, again, one, it has to do with uh, taking a broader look at all of the areas that, I mean, copyright permeates uh, pretty much all industries. And one of my favorite conversations to have when I meet people uh, that are not in the entertainment space is to ask them if they ever have any, uh, any if they have any copyright issues. And the general response, nine out of 10 is going to be, no, we don't. Like if you're in the, uh, some sort of the manufacturing area, for example. And then I start asking them questions. So, okay, your manufacturing uh, facilities, do you this, uh, do some of the machines run on software? Oh, yeah, it does. <laughs> then, you, know, you have a copyright problem. You have a copyright uh, uh, concern that you should be aware of. And, and then it goes, it goes, it goes from, uh, uh, from there. So, so, so I, I, I think, uh, I think, I think that's, you know, that's, the, that's how, uh, so when you're thinking about giving back, you have to broaden the areas that you can look at. Uh, one of the, uh, one of the projects that, one of the things that we're, we're working on, my firm is trying to work on the IPSJ is creating an education, educational program uh, 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 with IPSJ uh, to, to do some uh, educational program on copyright and trademark. Uh, not so much uh, patents, so that people can understand all the areas in which you have opportunities to actually to give back in our case, but to understand how vast the area is for you to be able to do something with. Yeah, and I would just add to that. I mean, I think, you know, from this uh, uh, wonderful program that you all put on today, uh, just hearing from the um, people of color um, who have spoken about the importance of copyright in their careers, it's very, very clear um, that as a, um, you know, uh, a attorney of color that you can easily give back to your community or other communities that are underrepresented by um, being that voice and advocate. Um, you have a lot of uh, creativity, I think, it, obviously, um, in a, all of these communities. Uh, and the problem has been, you know, as uh, has kind of was mentioned in with our the last um, presentation, that sometimes, um, you know, the, the that creative creativity has been exploited, and people haven't been able to either get the proper credit for their works, or to actually be able to get um, the, the right uh, amount of compensation for their works. And so having somebody from their community, who they can trust, will help to advocate for their voice, I think is, is, is an important part of giving back. Um, and it's unfortunate that I, I think in some sectors, um, you know, copyright law has, you know, it's, it's the, the, the notion of copyright law has been um, a little bit um, taken negatively. And it is, you know, been, you know, considered a, a negative aspect of, of society um, and, and a barrier. And it really, really is not. And you know, if it's you, if the legal system is used correctly, it really does allow people from all types of, of lifestyles and, and, and all communities to be able to show their creativity, show their uniqueness, and be able to get paid um, for um, the, the things that they love doing. And so I think that it is um, really important to have diversity both um, in the artists and creators themselves, but also in the advocates and lawyers who are working with them and who can actually give back to their community in that way as well. Great points. And Perfect way to uh, finish up our panel. I want to thank both of you for your insight. Um, really appreciate all of your comments and thoughtfulness. And now we're going to hear a few words from music producer Patrick Guitar Boy Hayes. Thank you. I'm music producer Guitar Boy, Patrick Guitar Boy Hayes. I've been doing it over um, professionally over 20 years now, and um, I've made a, a great living at it, and thank God for his blessing, and i um, able to uh, talk about how important it is to have your songs copywritten and have everything covered uh, by the law to protect you with your songwriting and um, the song that you are coming up and arranging. 
and I'm from uh, Mississippi. I grew up in a small town called Mendenhall, Mississippi. My mom raised me and my brother, Lance. And um, in, to, in music, when we was young, young kids, I was able to um, go into studios with my mom and my grandmother and um, my brother and do some recording. Um, so it was a great learning experience growing up in, in music and going through high school and to college. And uh, thank God for my family. And just uh, it's so important to make sure you're uh, writing and all your songwriting and the songs that you create that you're protected with the, your creativity um, with, that you're giving out to the world so you don't make sure you don't get ripped off or anything like that. And yeah. whatever that genre of music you're working on, just make sure it's very important to make sure that you protect your art and your work. Thanks again. Love you. Shout out to you guys. Blessings to you in all your endeavors. Make sure you support the Copyright Alliance. This is your boy, Patrick Guitar Boy Hayes. Hey, shout out to my manager, T. Thanks for everything. Thanks for setting this whole interview up. I appreciate you so much and the whole Guitar Boy team. Thank you. Love you guys. Till next time. Peace. <laughs>
So when Representative Davids talked about, you know, being the only person in the room, and Ms. De Zeus talked about learning how to advocate for herself in the room, I think that's true for so many of us that are participating in this conversation today, right? We have that internal sort of mental gymnastics or machinations of what others in the room may be assuming about us because of the way we look or speak. Um, and, you know, for me, that was also true in all the rooms that I've been in professionally, right? If I don't speak up, do I look like the quiet Asian woman who doesn't have anything to say? If I do speak up, do I look like the overeager Asian good girl who's trying to get the A plus right in the room? And I think what's important for all of us to remember as we leave today is that it's essential to understand what value you are committed to bringing into each and every room that you step into. But beyond that value that you yourself can bring, as you get more senior, and people like Greg spoke about this on the call, it's important to really figure out the means to sponsor others. So as Greg mentioned, this is about talking about people in the rooms that they are not yet in. It's about kicking open the door and inviting others to join us on the other side, right? So that is what I would call on everybody today to, to think about as they enter each and every room, both in their personal and professional lives to help encourage the diversity of viewpoints that we need to see to have as rich and robust a culture as we can. We learned a lot today, but it would simply be a missed opportunity if we didn't build on today's event and take actual action necessary to ensure a more equitable and inclusive ecosystem for everyone who's seeking careers in the creative industries, whether those be artists, executives, lawyers, or craftspeople. And for those of us who have been fortunate enough to be a part of this community and to achieve some level of success in the creative industries, we do have a special obligation to help make this sector even more welcoming to those who aspire to join us. So until our industry truly reflects the diversity of our community, we have a lot more work to do. And I'm asking each of you who participate in today's event to join me in this effort. Together, we can ensure that our industry offers opportunity to all those who have a desire, drive, talent, and skills to work in their chosen field. So thank you again for being part of today's event. And I look forward to continuing to work with you to make our industry all it can and should be. Stay safe, and my very best wishes for you for the holiday season. Thanks again.